Hey everybody, Danny Roddy, Bioenergetic Basics, episode number eight. And today we're going to talk about three common arguments against bioenergetics. The true method of knowledge is experiment, William Blake. And of course, in memory of Ray Pete, raypete.com. We'll talk about the course that I created later at the end of this episode. This episode is also brought to you by Progesty from Kinogen, kinogen kinogen.gmail.com. And we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so just to talk about what we're going to run through today, we're going to talk about the idea that you should completely avoid stress. We're going to talk about weight gain upon utilizing some of these ideas. And then we're going to talk about vitamin D toxicity and vitamin A toxicity, and we'll try to address those. So first, let's go over the idea that Ray Pete or Albert St. Georgie or Hans Selye are saying you want to avoid all stress. Let's bounce this off of The Stress of Life by Hans Selye, who is the guy that figured out how the HPA, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenals work. And let's bounce that off him and see what he has to say. So therefore, stress is not something to be avoided. Indeed, it cannot be avoided. Since staying alive creates some demand for life-maintaining energy, even while man is asleep, his heart, respiratory apparatus, digestive tract, nervous system, and other organs must continue to function. Complete freedom from stress can be expected only after death. So there you can clearly see that this is essentially a straw man. Nobody is saying sit in your house, don't do anything and don't accrue any stress. This is impossible because from your grandparents to your parents to you, you were never free to from stress to begin with. And stress was interacting with energy to shape you as an organism. And so this is not the point. And people that are saying this are essentially not understanding what's being talked about. So yeah, again, in his Stress of Life book says that every stress leaves an indelible scar and the organism pays for its survival after a stressful situation by becoming a little bit older. It's like we all have a big bag of bad shit that's happened to us over the course of our life, and you can add in stuff that happened to you when you were born, uh, stuff that happened in school, bad school, lunches, donuts, entomin donuts, dunkaroos, gushers, etc. Parents not cooking for you and you having to eat cereal every night. Every embarrassing moment of your life, etc. All that stuff culminates into a health problem, and that was Hans Selye's basic idea, that all these non-specific stimuli would result in a specific problem. And the quote he said that I really liked was that the body was like a chain. And although each part of the chain was exposed to stress equally, there's usually a weak link somewhere. So whether that's the person's liver or intestine or brain, et cetera, et cetera. And then that would manifest into the specific health problem. Selye did invoke the idea of energy metabolism as opposing stress. And so somebody on the comments had mentioned that this idea was myopic and this was Ray Pete's idea. And that's completely not true. People like Walter Cannon and Albert St. Georgie and Hans Selye were all talking about this stress energy idea way before Ray was talking about it. Biologic stress is closely linked to, though not identical with energy utilization. And he said, continued exposure to cold, or as far as that goes to any other stressor, sooner or later inexorably leads to breakdown of adaptive powers, that is exhaustion of what may be called the adaptation energy. And to Selye, adaptation energy could be spent like an inheritance. And so Ray, I think, has more of the right idea about optimizing known factors that increase energy generation. And the last thing to drive this really deep into the ground, does this sound like a guy that thinks you can avoid stress? U.S. people don't realize how ridiculously degraded their standard of living has become. Nutrition is political, economical. The governments tell people to eat beans and bread for a reason. And then more recently, he said, even thyroid and milkshakes and quesadillas aren't always enough to make up for the horrors that are imposed on us. And so again, this environment sucks and you can do so much. And I asked Ray in maybe one of the last gender of energies, I said, due to how bad this environment is, we're all just surviving, right, Ray? Where nobody's thriving. And he said, essentially, and we're all essentially sick with the same thing. We're sick with the bad environment. We're all doing the best we can, but we all have the same problem, but people are aren't acting like it. Okay, so let's talk about weight gain. And this is something I've been hearing many, many, many times over the last 12, 13, 14 years. And I think the idea here is that when a person starts drinking milk or drinking orange juice, a lot of people are under the impression that will increase my metabolism. Therefore, I should start losing weight or something like that. But very often by the age of 30 or 40 or older, the person is seriously screwed up at that point. And so just because a person is eating a certain way, no matter what that way is, it doesn't necessarily mean that their metabolism is good. And this is why it's so imperative to measure the pulse and temperature. And if their temperature is 95, like they have serious problems. And I wouldn't expect that to be corrected by diet alone at 30 or 40 or 50 or something. But just to get into the weeds a little bit more, there is a fantastic quote that I will not read the entire thing, but this is lactate versus CO2 and wound sickness, et cetera, in Ray's 2009 article. And this quote is talking about how cells get their energy from reducing protein, carbohydrate, and fat down into electrons, passing them through the cell, donating them to oxygen. Oxygen's availability is dependent on carbon dioxide, which you need good thyroid function to stimulate the production of carbon dioxide. And the NAD to NADH ratio is reflective of how many electrons are being passed to oxygen. And you will have a higher NAD to NADH ratio if you are effectively passing electrons to oxygen, having very few free electrons in cells to damage lipids. And so if that oxygen is not available due to a lack of carbon dioxide, the cell will have to find an alternative electron sink. And it can do this by donating electrons from NADH to NADP+, which is produced in the pentose phosphate pathway. And then this can produce NA 
NADPH, and that is the rate limiting factor for fat synthesis. So you can see how laying down lots of fat is another symptom of imperfect respiration. Therefore, the focus should be on the metabolism and not restricting calories or doing something crazy like lowering the carbohydrate or whatever. But this is the reason I think it's really important to have metabolic goggles on when thinking about stress and energy and weight gain. So another thing that's adjacent to the NED to NADH ratio is the respiratory quotient. The respiratory quotient is reflective of how much oxygen is being consumed and carbon dioxide is being produced. And as a person gets more dependent on the fatty acid metabolism and produces less carbon dioxide, their respiratory quotient will fall, which is synonymous with obesity. And here we see a respiratory quotient of 0.70 can only mean that oxygen is being used without the production of a corresponding amount of carbon dioxide. And here we can see the respiratory quotient in obese persons receiving a diet of 2,000 to 2,500 calories is 0.755, which is significantly below the normal average. The very low respiratory quotients encountered diabetes, starvation, and after the administration of a ketogenic diet are undoubtedly due in part at least to ketosis. So this is often thought of as a person eating too much fat based on their macronutrients, which could be a problem. However, when the thyroid function is low, a person is going to be on a high fat diet, whether they like it or not. Their hypothalamus, pituitary adrenals, and endotoxin tend to be higher. And those all promote lipolysis or the liberation of free fatty acids into the blood. And they will be using those as a fuel. It's really independent of what they're eating. I mean, if they eat a very high sugar diet, they could suppress those systems and stop it to some degree, but it just depends how serious the situation is. Inverse relationship between respiratory quotient and body fat goes back to that repeat quote talking about NADH, NADH and that being the determinant of laying down body fat, very closely lining with the respiratory quotient. And here, even if the metabolism was imperfect, just going to altitude could cause weight loss. So the, the altitude, the carbon dioxide would accelerate the rate of electron transfer to oxygen, and that could increase the person's metabolic rate and they could lose weight. And let's just get to a few other things that I'm thinking of. So these are Danny's weight loss suggestions. <laughs> I would pay attention to the underarm temperature and the pulse rate. Temperature is 95 or 96. They have serious hypothyroidism and it will probably be impossible to lose weight or they'll be on a slow trajectory towards weight gain, eating to appetite. And if their temperature and pulse comes up and they're like, hey man, I'm still gaining lots of weight, I would recommend doing exercise that they could breathe through their nose when doing and then they enjoy it. And I think those are the two most important things for any exercise, breathing through the nose and making sure that you enjoy the exercise, not doing something that you absolutely hate. And if you put a gun to my head and ask macronutrient wise, what are the most important mix of macronutrients? for weight loss. At this moment, I'm really convinced that a high carb, lower fat and lower protein diet is probably right. This is funny because it makes me think of fruitarianism. So the last thing on our list to talk about today is vitamin toxicity fats. And this started for me around 2020 when people were mentioning that vitamin D was toxic. If a person is into the idea that it is toxic, I would just recommend going to read this article on my Substack. I approached 13 or 14 of the most common arguments that I was seeing. If you're convinced that vitamin A is toxic though, we can talk about that a little bit more. So let's just talk about steroids steroid metabolism very quickly. And so T3, the active thyroid hormone triiodothyronine, along with LDL cholesterol and vitamin A are synthesized into pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA or dihydroepiandrosterone in the mitochondria of cells. Without vitamin A, the steroids cannot be produced. This shows you how essential vitamin A is for stress resistance, because if you don't make enough pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA, you'll be exposed to more cortisol, estrogen, aldosterone, adrenaline, etc. And then those will impair cellular respiration. So from the bottom to the top is steroid synthesis, and from the left to the right is energy metabolism. And and vitamin A, right? It's been saying this forever. And this is why it was kind of shocking to me that the vitamin A toxicity gained so much steam. Ray has been saying that vitamin A is highly unsaturated. In excess, it suppresses the thyroid. It, so it has to be balanced with the thyroid. Just so we're not taking his word for it, here's a food chemistry book, which says basically the same thing, that vitamin A is very unsaturated and also says the degradation of vitamin A parallels unsaturated fats. Vitamin A suppressing thyroid is very old. It goes back to uh, Thomas McGavick, or it might be even older than this, but 1951. And I could personally attest to this, when I was low, very low thyroid, 2011, 2012, I would consume too much liver and become freezing cold. I, I can't tell you precisely that it wasn't the amino acids, it was the vitamin A, but if I took a vitamin A supplement, too much of it, I would get the same effect. I would become freezing cold. I empathize with people that think vitamin A is harmful because, again, I could understand how that would be possible. The last thing before we wrap it up here, but this is a paper by a guy named Taraskin, and he says, this approach suggests that the healthier the sample, the greater the daily vitamin A intake. And so a person starts taking thyroid hormone, eats carbohydrate, calcium, etc. Their metabolism will accelerate and they'll probably need more vitamin A, but a very low thyroid person might not need much more than an egg a day. Vitamin A needs very widely haphazard intake of vitamin A. I talked to lots of people that are just taking 10,000 IUs of vitamin A per day, and I usually recommend just stopping for safety. Okay. So bioenergetic basics, this is a course I made. It's a crash course on not theory. It's more application. And these were things that were coming up over and over and over in calls. And so I just took two and a half hours, recorded it, went through thyroid, nutrition, optimizing the the home environment, reading lab tests, et cetera, and tried to put everything I've learned
learned from talking to thousands of people, men and women, into this course. I edited it down to an hour and 10 minutes and was very happy with it. And I'm getting great feedback on it. Really appreciate all the support. And that's available on Patreon and Gumroad. Gumroad to purchase and download it and Patreon to stream it. This episode is also brought to you by Kenogen's Progest E. Ray in 2018 said, I think it's the only good progesterone product. I'd have to agree. And you can email Kenogen at gmail.com and talk to Catherine about ordering. She'll send you a requisition form. Uh, she'll ship it out very quickly and efficiently. Guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I have an amazing audience and these are always really fun to do. I think I'll be doing more of these little argument things. And I tried doing five at a time, but it was way too long. So I had to do three. <laughs> okay. Talk to you guys soon. Peace out. Bye-bye.